Note. All Bible quotes in this presentation are from the 1611 King James Bible, as translated out of the original language Hebrew. Here are six biblical and historical cases, that prove without a shadow of doubt, that the ancient Hebrews, from the patriarch Abraham to the nation of Israel, were a black people. Case number 1. Adam was made out of black mud. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God created the first man Adam from the dust of the earth. His body was made out of mud or clay. In the Hebrew, Adam, or autumn, is defined as swarthy, dusky, reddish-brown soil, dark-skinned like a shadow. Webster's Dictionary defines the word swarthy as, being of a dark hue or dusky complexion, tawny, black, as the swarthy African. In warm climates, the complexion of men is universally swarthy or black. While the word dusky is defined as, tending to blackness in color, partially black, dark colored, not bright, as a dusky brown. The word dust as used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, in the Hebrew language is afar, and it is defined as, the soil from which Adam was made, meaning, dust, clay, always very black or very dark brown in color. The Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, confirms the reading of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that God created Adam out of black mud and fashioned him into shape. Surah Al-Hijr chapter 15, verse 26 to 28. Surely we created man of dry ringing clay of black mud wrought into shape, and when your Lord said to the angels, See I am creating a man of dry ringing clay, of black mud wrought into shape. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, and 10 to 14. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the name of the second river is Gion, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidakel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. The Garden of Eden was described in Genesis as having been near a four-river system in the region of the lands of Cush, Havilah, and Asher, which today would be near the borders of eastern Sudan, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. The birthplace of humanity was confirmed when the oldest human remains were found in Ethiopia in 1974. Science and the Bible are often at odds, but one thing both confirm is that the birthplace of humanity was in East Africa. Worldwide, scientists agree that the Garden of Eden was in Northeast Africa, and that the first man Adam, was an African. Scientists from around the world, have proven that humankind originated in Northeast Africa, and the world's first man was black. The first parents of all mankind were black people, and they came from Northeast Africa. Africa is the mother of all humankind, and it is known as the cradle of human civilization. Case number 2. The Origins of the Hebrews. Genesis chapter 10, verse 21 to 22, and 24. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. And Arphaxad begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber. Eber came from the chosen seed line that led to the nation of Israel. Abraham is the first person called a Hebrew, Genesis chapter 14, verse 13, in the biblical text. What does the name Hebrew mean and where does it come from? Abraham's fifth great-grandfather was Eber. And Arpachshad, bore, Shalak, who bore Eber, Genesis chapter 10, verse 24. The Hebrew spelling of the word Hebrew is, Ivri, 
and the Hebrew spelling of Eber is, Eber. When the letter is placed after a name it means one belonging to the family of. And in this case a Hebrew is one who belongs to the family of Eber. By definition, a Hebrew is one who is descended from Eber and this would include Abraham as well as his brothers Nahor and Haran. While the lineages of Nahor and Haran seem to disappear, probably absorbed into other cultural groups, only Abraham and his descendants remain Hebrews to this day. The root, Abr, means to cross over or pass through. As names play a very significant role of the ancient peoples of the Near East, this name and its meaning is indicative of Abraham and his descendants. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were nomads who by definition are ones who travel or pass through many lands on their nomadic journey. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, we read, from the KJV, and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. The phrase passed through is the Hebrew verb, the same word as the noun or name ever. In today's world, the Hebrews are simply the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ancient Hebrews originated in Chaldea, which was occupied by ancient Babylonians. They came from Mesopotamia, an area that was anciently located in northeast Africa, otherwise known as the Middle East today. The Old Testament account of Hebrew origins begins with Terah of the Chaldean city of Ur, in Mesopotamia, and his three sons, Haran, Nahor, and Abraham. Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 to 28. Now these are the generations of Terah, Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. So Terah was a Chaldean by nationality and lived in Ur, with his three sons, which includes Abraham. Abraham and his wife Sarah left Ur because God promised him and his descendants a land they could call their own. Genesis chapter 15, verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. Before Abraham eventually settled in a land called Canaan, he was living in the city Ur, in southern Mesopotamia. Ancient Chaldeans, or Babylonians, were a Cushite, or simply an Ethiopian people. Cush was the son of Ham, and his descendants were anciently called Cushites, see Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. The Cushites, or Ethiopians, are the descendants of Ham. Bible scholars agree that dark races are descendants of Ham. This means that the Hebrews dwelt among black people, and probably made intermarriages with them. Godfrey Higgins, a reliable English antiquary says. The Chaldeans were originally Negroes. Professor Rudolf Windsor agreed with this, and in his book, From Babylon to Timbuktu, he wrote. The Chaldeans and the other people of that region were jet black in their complexion. The ancient Sumerians called themselves Sagag, meaning black-headed ones, this is because they had shaven heads. The ancient Chaldeans were their cousins. Terah, Abraham's father, was a relative of Nimrod. He was a merchant who sold idols in the city of Ur. Biblically, we know that Nimrod was the son of Cush. Cush is the progenitor of the Ethiopians, and it's a well-known fact that the Ethiopians are black. So. This means that Nimrod was also black. Abraham came from Ur in southern Mesopotamia, which in his day was overwhelmingly populated with black-skinned people. The root word of Ur is Ur which means fire oven. The average temperatures in the region of Ur, is 125 degrees. This means that the people in that part of the world had to have large amounts of melanin in their skin, in order to withstand the heat from the sun. This leaves us with only one logical conclusion, and that is, the people who inhabited ancient Chaldea, including the Hebrews, were indeed black. An Egyptian scholar by the name of Dr. Charles S. Finch III, M.D., says in his book Echoes of the Old Dark Land, on pages 5 and 32, we know from the fate of albinos all over Africa that unprotected skin, or light skin, is subject to grotesque, disfiguring cancers that are soon fatal. Melanin, the substance that gives the skin a dark brown or black pigment, by absorbing ultraviolet radiation and scattering the ions produced,
protects the skin from cancer. So, for Abraham to have come from that part of the world, he had to have very dark black skin. The Elamites are Shem's other black skinned sons from the region of Or. Genesis chapter 10, verse 22. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. The descendants of Elam, one of Shem's sons, are known as the Elamites. What cannot be denied also is that Abraham's grandson Keter was a black man. Genesis chapter 25, verse 13. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajith, and Keter, and Adbeel, and Mipsam. In the Hebrew, the name Keter is Keter, Strong's number 6938, meaning swarthy, black tented. According to Merriam Webster's dictionary, the English word swarthy is defined as having dark skin. If Keter, the grandson of Abraham, had black skin, then Abraham must have been black as well. Abraham is the father of Isaac. Isaac is the father of the patriarch Jacob. Jacob had twelve sons and these sons are the progenitors of the Hebrew Israelite nation. The twelve tribes of Israel are as follows, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Each one of Jacob's sons became a tribal nation which made up the greater nation of Israel. For example, Reuben's descendants became known as the tribe of Reuben. Judah's descendants became known as the tribe of Judah and so on. The nation of Israel are the descendants of Jacob whose name was changed to Israel by God, see Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Case number 3. The Hebrews described themselves as having black skin. Job chapter 30, verse 30. My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burned with heat. The patriarch Job described his skin to be black. The word black, used in this text, is Hebrew Shacher, Strong's number 7835, defined as to be dim or dark, in color, or to be black. According to the previous text that we just read, Job's skin was black. Some people try to dismiss this by claiming that whenever the Hebrews were in mourning, they covered themselves in ashes, which is true. But then they argue that Job covered himself in ashes, and as a result his skin turned black. This cannot be true because when ash is applied on the skin, it does not turn the skin black but rather white. So, it was not because Job covered himself in ashes that he said his skin was black, but rather because Job was a person of color, who spent a lot of time in the sun because of his calamity. This made his skin look even darker. Lamentations Chapter 5 Verse 10. Our skin was black like an oven, because of the terrible famine. The Israelites always described their skin color to be black. They got even darker after spending some time in the sun, or due to disasters such as famine and pestilences. If the Hebrews had white skin, and were out in the sun, their skin would not go from white or light to black like an oven due to famine or prolonged exposure to sunlight. This is only true for people of color. The picture you're looking at right now, is of a typical stone oven that would have been used by the Hebrews, at the time that Jeremiah wrote the verse we just read. You can clearly see how dark the inside of the oven is. It gives you an idea of how the Israelites looked, because only Negroes can describe themselves in such a manner. White people do not turn black when they get sick or suffer malnutrition, in fact, it is quite the opposite as they become pale. Only people of color get darker when they get sick or suffer malnutrition. It is a well-known fact that white people turn red when they are exposed to the sun for a long time, as they develop sunburns. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 2, and 7 to 8. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? Her Nazarites were purer than snow, they were whiter than milk, they were more ruddy in body than rubies, their polishing was of sapphire, their visage is blacker than a coal, they are not known in the streets, their skin cleaveth to their bones, it is withered, it is become like a stick. The word ruddy in Hebrew is Adam, Strong's number 119, 
defined as to show blood, in the face, flush or turn rosy, to be, dyed, made, red, ruddy, keeping Lamentations chapter 4, verse 7, in context, the reference to being whiter than milk is a reference to the Nazarite's moral character and not skin color. That is why Jeremiah gets more specific by mentioning the fact that the Israelites were more ruddy in body than rubies. Hence, making a clear difference between whiter than milk and more ruddy in body than rubies. The former is talking about an Israelite's character and the later is about skin color. At this point, we must conclude that the Hebrews were a very deep, dark red people because no one is bright red. The word visage used in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 8, refers to a person's appearance, Strong's number 8389. It is defined as, a person's face, with reference to the form of the features. Here the Israelites are described as having their appearance blacker than a coal. By mentioning coal, Jeremiah is giving us something visual to reference, hence ruling out any possibility of him referring to their demeanor or emotional state. The Hebrew word black, as used here, is shashak, Strong's number 2821, and it is defined as to be or grow dark. Jeremiah is telling us here that the children of Israel were black people, and when they were in affliction, their skin color became darker than coal. If the children of Israel were any other people apart from black people, Jeremiah would have never described their appearance to be darker than a coal. So in context, the Israelites turned from being ruddy looking to being darker than a coal, because of the calamities they were going through at the time. Such an occurrence can only happen to black people as is evident all throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Song of Songs Chapter 1, Verse 5 to 6 I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me, my mother's children were angry with me, they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Here we have Solomon's lover, telling us twice that she is black. The word black, as used in the previous text, is Hebrew shachor, Strong's number 7838, defined as properly, dusky, but also absolutely jetty black. The Shulamite woman is telling us that she is a black woman, and that her skin is very dark due to prolonged exposure to the sun. She even goes as far as comparing her own skin to the tents of Kedar, the curtains of Solomon. This is consistent with how the Hebrews described their appearance, all throughout scripture, just as we have shown you, thus far. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, and chapter 2, verse 18. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. The text describes Jesus Christ as having his feet looking like fine brass, burned in a furnace. Fine brass is dark brown, and when it's burned in a furnace, it is very dark. Only black people have skin color that looks like that of brass burned in a furnace, which is a very deep dark brown. Robert Eastler, in a classic 1931 study of Josephus' testimony, was able to reconstruct the unaltered testimony based on a newly discovered old Russian translation, that preserved the original Greek text. According to Eastler's reconstruction, the oldest non-biblical description of Jesus read as follows. At that time also there appeared a certain man of magic power, if it be meet to call him a man, whose name is Jesus, whom certain Greeks call a son of a god, but his disciples call him the true prophet, he was a man of simple appearance, mature age, black-skinned, short growth, three cubits tall, hunchbacked, prognathous, with a long face, a long nose, eyebrows meeting above the nose, with scanty curly hair, but having a line in the middle of the head after the fashion of the Nazareans, with an undeveloped beard. 
the Roman Emperor, Justinian the Great, who ruled from 527 to 564 CE, which is basically 500 years after the time of Jesus, had engraved on a coin, the image of Christ with woolly kinky hair and black features. On the obverse side of the coin, there is an image of Justinian but with straight hair. The Cambridge Encyclopedia has this to say about that image on the coin. Whatever the fact, this coin, with the straight hair Justinian on the obverse side, places beyond doubt the belief that Jesus was a Negro, or simply a black-skinned person. Jesus was black just like all the Hebrews of the Bible. All the oldest known paintings of Jesus Christ depict him as a black man with woolly hair. He was never depicted white until the Renaissance period. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5 and 7. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. The prophet Ezekiel was shown a vision, in which he describes four living creatures standing before the throne of God. The creatures had the appearance of burnished brass. The Hebrew word for brass is chakalibanon, Strong's number 5474, it is defined as burnished copper, an alloy of copper, or gold, and silver having a brilliant luster, fine brass. The word fine in Hebrew is puru, Strong's number 4448, defined as to kindle, to be ignited, glow, literally, be refined, by implication, or, figuratively, to be inflamed, with anger, grief, lust, burn, fiery, be on fire, trot. So basically, the four heavenly beings that Ezekiel saw in the vision, had the color of burnished copper, which is just an alloy of copper and silver. This means that the creatures looked very dark brown, just like the Negroes. Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 2 to 3. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me upon a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and, behold, there was a man, whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. This is the second time Ezekiel is shown a vision in which heavenly beings are seen as being in appearance like unto brass. On two occasions now, angels are described as having appearance of brass. We all know that only people of color have skin that looks like burnt brass. Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 to 6. Then I lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of uphaz, his body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Daniel had a similar vision like the one that was shown to Ezekiel. In the vision, Daniel saw a heavenly being whose body looked like beryl, whereas his arms and legs had the appearance of polished brass. Only people of color can be described as such. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. The Apostle John saw a vision of God, and described his appearance as looking like a jasper and a sardine stone. Thus far, it is clear that God and the angels are described in such a way that only black people bear a strong resemblance to them. Whenever God or the angels appeared to the prophets in human form, they appeared as black men because Adam was created in the image of God. Many people try to allegorize the visions that God showed to the prophets Ezekiel, Daniel, and John. These servants of God were describing what they saw and heard, to the best of their ability. Part of the description was noting that the Israelites and heavenly beings had appearance like burnt brass. Hence, making it very clear that the Hebrews are black people. It is very hard to deny the color of the children of Israel as shown all throughout the Bible, but there will still be those that play semantics with the colors in order to deny the obvious. The prophets used similes, 
which indicates a comparison, and not an allegory. As we have seen, there are several direct references to black skin in both the Old and New Testaments. These verses imply, beyond any reasonable doubt, the fact that the Hebrews had dark skin. However, it is very important to note that there is no verse in the Bible that says that the Hebrews had white or light skin. The Bible definitely emphasizes that leprosy turns a person white as snow. If these people were already white or light-skinned, the emphasis wouldn't be needed. Throughout the Bible, white skin tends to be only mentioned in association with leprosy, and in one instance as a curse on an entire lineage of Elisha's servant Gehazi. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 27. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. When you read the whole chapter 5 of 2 Kings, you will find out that Naaman was a leper since birth, meaning he was white, more like an albino in today's world. Naaman went to the prophet Elisha to be healed of his leprosy, and was instructed to bath himself seven times in the Jordan River for his flesh to be restored to its original color. Eventually, Naaman did what he was told to do, and was healed. As we get down to verse 27, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, and all of his descendants are cursed by Elisha to be white as snow, for taking gifts from Naaman under false pretense. The text says that Gehazi went away from Elisha, after being cursed, a leper as white as snow. This means that Gehazi, being an Israelite, was a black man and did not have white skin, but his skin turned white because of the curse of leprosy. The text also says this would be the condition of Gehazi and his offsprings forever. Meaning all the descendants of Gehazi would be white from generation to generation until the end of the world, or at least to the last descendant of Gehazi. Numbers chapter 12, verse 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and, behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and, behold, she was leprous. God cursed Miriam with leprosy for going against Moses' leadership, because of the Ethiopian woman which he married. According to the passage, Miriam's skin turned as white as snow. There was no way such an occurrence could have happened, if she had white skin already. The only logical conclusion remaining, is that Miriam was a person of color, whose skin turned white like snow as a result of the curse of leprosy, pronounced on her by the prophet Moses. Exodus chapter 4, verse 4, and 6 to 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, and the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom, and, behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. God performed a miracle on the hand of Moses by making it leprous, as white as snow. The text makes a difference between before the miracle was wrought and during the time it became leprous as white as snow. So, Moses's hand got leprosy and then it went back to its original color, making it very clear that Moses was a person of color. There are several scholars around the world, who strongly believe that some of the references to leprosy in the Bible, refer to vitiligo or albinism. Case number 4. The Hebrews had woolly hair, and grew dreadlocks by letting their hair lock naturally over time. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. The Ancient of Days is simply the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. According to the passage, the God of Israel has woolly hair just like the Negroes. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire.
Jesus Christ was described in a similar manner. According to the vision that the Apostle John saw, Christ had woolly hair. Remember also that he had feet like brass, hence augmenting the fact that the Messiah was a black man. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the Negro properly so-called is dark-skinned, with woolly hair and other characteristics, while differing in minor traits. Afro-textured hair is the natural hair texture of certain populations in Africa, the African diaspora, Oceania, and in some parts of South and Southeast Asia. In many post-Columbian, Western societies, adjectives such as woolly, kinky, nappy, or spiraled have frequently been used to describe natural afro-textured hair. So, Western societies use the word woolly as one of the adjectives to describe Negro hair. When the Bible says that the God of Israel and Jesus the Messiah have hair white like wool, it is simply telling us that they have Negro hair, looking exactly like that of Africans. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, and 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to thou, a thou of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord he shall come at no dead body. And this is the law of the Nazarite, when the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So according to the passage, when an Israelite, either male or female, took an oath to be a Nazarite for life or some days, he or she was required by Hebrew law to adhere to certain rules. Following a strict diet and drinking no alcohol were some of the rules the Nazarite was required to abide by. But most importantly, he or she was required to grow dreadlocks naturally, and never shave his or her head until the days of being a Nazarite were fulfilled. This is exactly what the Rastas abide by. Generally, Rastas are very much health conscious. They follow a strict dietary law called Edel, which states that all food must be completely natural and raw. They do not eat food that is not nourishing to their body, which includes meat. This is so because they regard their body to be a temple of God, based on biblical teachings. Rastas do not drink alcohol either. They grow dreadlocks naturally, and do not shave their heads. It is a well-known fact that dreadlocks form naturally over time for black people only. Despite their controversial beliefs, Rastas are modern-day Nazarites following in the footsteps of their Hebrew forefathers. Judges chapter 13, verse 2 to 7, and 24. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for, lo, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible, but I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name, but he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Samson was born of a barren woman married to a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan. Before his birth, 
the angel of God appeared to Samson's mother telling her that she would conceive and bear a son who was to be a Nazarite all his life. Meaning he was never to drink alcohol or eat unclean foods. And most importantly, Samson's head was never to be shaved throughout his life. Judges chapter 16, verse 13, and 19. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies, tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Samson was raised a Nazarite for life, meaning he was never to shave his head all throughout his life. He was given specific instructions by God, which included never cutting off his hair, because in doing so lied his incredible strength. The Bible says that Delilah managed to seduce Samson and eventually cut off his seven locks. This would mean that by the time Delilah seduced him to shave his head, his hair had already grown into dreadlocks naturally. This gives a very strong indication that Samson was a black man because when Negroes do not shave their hair or comb it, dreadlocks form naturally over time. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 15, and 19 to 21. But the priests the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God, and when they go forth into the utter court, even into the utter court to the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered, and lay them in the holy chambers, and they shall put on other garments, and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long, they shall only pull their heads. Neither shall any priest drink wine, when they enter into the inner court. Just like the Nazarites, the priests of Israel were given specific instructions by God that they had to abide by. The rules included not drinking alcohol when the priests entered into the inner court of the temple, and most essentially, they were never to shave their heads nor allow their dreads to grow long. The fact that the priests in Israel did not shave their heads and had short locks, means that their hair formed dreadlocks naturally. This is only true for people of color, meaning that the priests of Israel were Negroes. Song of Songs Chapter 5, Verse 11 His head is as the most fine gold, his locks are bushy, and black as a raven. King Solomon was described by the Shulamite woman as having bushy dreadlocks, which were black like a raven. Only Negro dreadlocks fit the description of being bushy and black like a raven, meaning King Solomon was a black man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. The Apostle Paul advised Israelite women to dress decently and be humble. He was against broiding or braiding of hair, especially for show-off. According to Webster's Dictionary, the word broid is an obsolete variant of braid. Whereas the word braid is defined as to do up the hair by interweaving three or more strands. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. Webster's Dictionary defines the word plate as, to interweave the strands or locks of braid. So, the word plate has the same meaning as braid. As biblically evidenced, Israelite women braided or plaited their hair for show off, this took a lot of their time, hence attracting rebuke from the apostles Peter and Paul. Braiding and plaiting of hair must have become a common tradition among Israelite women, for the apostles to come out against the practice in such a strong manner. We know that braids and plaits have been common cultural hairstyle among the Bantus in Africa and the Diaspora. Bantu women braid or plait their hair more than any other race in the world. This is so because it has always been part of their tradition from time immemorial. Leviticus chapter 13, 
verse 31 to 32, and 36 to 37. And if the priest look on the plague of the skull, and behold, it be not in sight deeper than the skin, and that there is no black hair in it, then the priest shall shut up him that hath the plague of the skull seven days, and in the seventh day the priest shall look on the plague, and, behold, if the skull spread not, and there be in it no yellow hair, and the skull be not in sight deeper than the skin, then the priest shall look on him, and, behold, if the skull be spread in the skin, the priest shall not seek for yellow hair, he is unclean. But if the skull be in his sight at a stay, and that there is black hair grown up therein, the skull is healed, he is clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. In Levitical law, the priests were given clear instructions on how to diagnose the plague of the skull. They simply had to look for yellow hair and a scaly eruption of the skin on the scalp, in order to tell whether a person had the plague or not. If a person had these two symptoms, then the priest would pronounce them to be unclean. Webster's Dictionary defines the word blonde as, a light yellowish brown to dark grayish yellow, or of a flaxen, golden, light auburn, or pale yellowish brown color so, blonde hair is simply yellow hair. We all know that blonde hair is natural to people of European descent, whereas black woolly hair is natural to people of African descent. And we know that the only time blonde or yellow hair is mentioned in the Bible, is in relation to the plague of the skull. This means that the Israelites of the Bible did not have blonde hair, because it was associated with the plague of the skull. Case number 5. The Hebrews physically looked like the ancient Egyptians and Ethiopians, in appearance. One of the best ways to identify the skin color of the Hebrews in the Bible, is by finding out the true appearance of the ancient Egyptians. This is so because people of other nationalities constantly mistook the Israelites of the Bible for the Egyptians. It is also important to know that the children of Israel looked like the Ethiopians. One of the facts scripture gives us about Israel has to do with their physical appearance. Throughout scripture, Israel is described as physically looking like the sons of Ham in appearance. Ham was one of Noah's three sons, Shem and Japheth were the other two. Genesis chapter 6, verse 10. And chapter 10, verse 6. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. Noah's descendants repopulated the earth after the great flood. Ham's descendants are traced to the families of Africa. All four of Ham's sons and their descendants occupied the regions in and around the continent of Africa, which included what is today referred to as the Middle East which was also a part of the continent of Africa. Ham's sons are the people of the African continent, which include the ancient Egyptians, Ethiopians, Somalians, Sudanese, Canaanites, and Libyans. Ham was the youngest son of Noah, and he had four sons, Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. The descendants of Ham are called Hamites. Mizraim was the second son of Ham. Mizraim, also known as Masar or Masra, is the name of a biblical man, a people, and a land. The Mizraim people, or Mizraites, are simply descendants of Mizraim, the second son of Ham. The land of Mizraim is just a name that was generally given by the Hebrews to the land of Egypt, and may denote the two Egypts, the upper and the lower. Genesis chapter 50, verse 11. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the morning in the floor of Adad, they said, This is a grievous morning to the Egyptians, Wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. According to Istan's Bible Dictionary, Abel Mizraim means meadow of Egypt, or morning of Egypt, a place beyond, in other words, on the west of Jordan, at the threshing floor of Adad. Here the Egyptians mourned seventy days for Jacob, Genesis chapter 50, verse 4 to 11. Its site is unknown. So in simple terms, Mizraim was the progenitor of the ancient Egyptians because the word Mizraim refers to the land of Egypt. And by now we know that the ancient Egyptians were descendants of Ham, and would be known as the Hamites. Zondervan Bible Dictionary asserts that, Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, 
not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. Bible scholars agree that the Hamites are the dark races, which include the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. This means that the ancient Egyptians were a black people. They were indeed what we know today as black Negroes. This is historical fact. Gerald Massey, the English writer and author of the book, Egypt the Light of the World, wrote, The dignity is so ancient that the insignia of the pharaoh evidently belonged to the time when Egyptians wore nothing but the girdle of the Negro. Sir Richard Francis Burton, a 19th century English explorer, writer, and linguist in 1883 wrote the following to Gerald Massey. You are quite right about the African origin of the Egyptians. I have 100 human skulls to prove it. Scientist, Robert Taylor Pritchett, states in his book The Natural History of Man. In their complex and many of the complexions, and in physical peculiarities, the Egyptians were an African race. This fact is also supported by secular historians. Ancient Greek historians never had any confusion on the inhabitants of ancient Egypt. They knew that long ago, ancient Egypt began as a northern extension of Nubian culture and people. A Greek historian by the name of Herodotus, commonly known as the father of history, and a person we would call white, talks at length about black-skinned people. Herodotus visited Egypt 75 years after the Persians had taken over but before the Greeks, Romans, and Arabs conquered the land. He traveled the whole length of the country from north to south. David H. Kelly in his book, Egyptians and Ethiopians, Color, Race, and Racism, quotes Herodotus as stating that The Colchians, Ethiopians, and Egyptians have thick lips, broad nose, woolly hair and they are burnt skin, the Colchidans are Egyptians by race, the Colchidans were descended from soldiers of Sesostris, Senusret, an Egyptian pharaoh. I had conjectured as much myself from two pointers, Firstly because they have black skins and kinky hair. As per most translations, Herodotus described ancient Egyptians as having black skin with woolly hair. He is also quoted asserting that, the Greek oracle was known to be from Egypt because she was black, and the natives of the Nile region are black with heat. So, Herodotus knew very well that the ancient Egyptians were a black people. Anthropologist, Count Constantin de Volney, who lived from 1727 to 1820, spoke about the race of the Egyptians that produced the pharaohs. He later paid tribute to Herodotus' discovery when he said, The ancient Egyptians were true Negroes of the same type as all native-born Africans. That being so, we can see how their blood mixed for several centuries with that of the Romans and Greeks, must have lost the intensity of its original color, while retaining nonetheless the imprint of its original mold. We can even state as a general principle that the face is a kind of monument, able in many cases to attest to or shed light on historical evidence on the origins of the people. The fact that the ancient Egyptians were black-skinned prompted Volney to make the following statement, what a subject for meditation, just think that the race of black men today are slaves and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, science, and even the use of our speech. George Rawlinson, an English author wrote a book entitled History of Egypt. On page 252, he gives a description of Set I, the pharaoh that is believed to have been on the throne of Egypt at the time of Moses' birth. He states, Set's face was thoroughly African. He had a stormy face with a depressed flat nose, thick lips, and heavy chin. Aristotle is another Greek philosopher who confirmed the fact that the Egyptians were black. He described them in the following manner, those who are too black are cowards, like for instance the Egyptians and Ethiopians. But those who are excessively white are also cowards as we can see from the example of women, the complexion of courage lies between the two. Notice that Aristotle put great emphasis on the Egyptians being too black. Hence, letting everyone know that the ancient Egyptians had a very dark appearance. Aeschylus was another Greek historian who wrote about the ancient Egyptians being black. He made the following statement in describing an Egyptian crew, I can see the crew with their black limbs and white tunics. A Greek writer by the name of Lucian when describing an ancient Egyptian boy said, This boy is not merely black, he has thick lips and his legs are too thin. At this point, 
it cannot be denied that the ancient Greeks knew that the Egyptians were definitely dark people, because they interacted with them socially, politically, and economically. Ammianus Marcellinus was a Roman soldier and historian who wrote the penultimate major historical account surviving from antiquity. He observed the following concerning the ancient Egyptians, the men of Egypt are mostly brown and black with a skinny and desiccated look. Ammianus Marcellinus's confirmation of the fact that the Egyptians were black cannot be overemphasized. Professor Czech Hunter Diop was a Senegalese historian, anthropologist, physicist, and politician who studied the human race's origins and pre-colonial African culture. He wrote a book entitled The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality in which he state that Ancient Egypt was a Negro civilization. The history of black Africa will remain suspended in the air and cannot be written correctly until African historians dare to connect it with the history of Egypt. The African historian who evades the problem of Egypt is neither modest nor objective nor unruffled. He is ignorant, cowardly, and neurotic. The ancient Egyptians were Negroes. The moral fruit of their civilization is to be counted among the assets of the black world. In practice it is possible to determine directly the skin color and hence the ethnic affiliations of the ancient Egyptians by microscopic analysis in the laboratory, I doubt if the sagacity of the researchers who have studied the question has overlooked the possibility. The evidence concerning the true appearance of the ancient Egyptians is so overwhelming that only people with an agenda dare to reject the fact that the Egyptians were black, an Egyptologist by the name of Stuart Tyson Smith wrote an article that was published by Oxford University in which he asserted that any characterization of race of the ancient Egyptians depends on modern cultural definitions, not on scientific study. Thus, by modern American standards it is reasonable to characterize the Egyptians as black, while acknowledging the scientific evidence for the physical diversity of Africans. Louis Seymour Bazet Leakey was a British paleoanthropologist and archaeologist whose work was important in demonstrating that humans evolved in Africa, particularly through discoveries made at Old Uvahai Gorge with his wife and fellow paleontologist Mary Leakey. He made the following statement concerning Africa. The critics of Africa forget that men of science today are without exception, satisfied that Africa was the place of birth of man himself, and that for thousands of years, Africa was in the forefront of all world progress. In ancient times, the dark races, which are basically the descendants of Ham the youngest son of Noah, had great empires second to none. Back then, the Hamitic races were simply on top of the world, and they had great wealth much like the Europeans of today. Ed M. Kotjo, the author of Africa Tomorrow who happened to be a great researcher on Africa confirmed this when he stated that. It is here in Africa that history began. Far from being a gratuitous assertion, this statement is undeniable scientific fact for which one finds corroboration when one roves the world in search of the remains of the ancient civilizations. According to the present state of research on the origins of the progress of humankind and civilization, the mother of mankind, Africa remains the privileged source of the manifestations of intense human creativity. As evidently shown, the Egyptian civilization was a black civilization. The people that built the pyramids in Egypt, which even in the 21st century cannot be reproduced, were black. Black people built all the cities of ancient Egypt, and this includes the city of Memphis which was constructed in about 3100 BC. The pharaohs that ruled during the time of Moses were black, and they used the Israelites as slaves to build up their nation. Exodus Chapter 1 Verse 7 to 11. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we, come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass, that, when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies, and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses.
the Hebrews were a part of ancient Egyptian civilization as they provided free slave labor, which was essential in building up Egypt. In fact, people of other nationalities often confused the Israelites with the ancient Egyptians. At this point, it must be noted that the modern Arabs who currently dominate the region of North Africa, are not the same as the ancient Egyptians who occupied that land during the time of Moses. Keep in mind that Egypt has changed several times since the time of the Mosaic Exodus. This is due to the conquest of Egypt by the Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, Hyksos, Romans, and lastly the Arabs. Most of the people of modern Egypt are descended from Arabs who invaded Egypt in the 7th century and whitened the population. It must be understood that the original inhabitants and founders of this vastly important civilization were its native black people. It is also very important to note that just because the ancient Egyptians were black does not mean that every person of African descent is an Egyptian. Today the living descendants of ancient Egyptians are most likely the Somalians and Sudanese. In fact, the Beja people of northeast Sudan and southern Egypt are a true representation of ancient Egyptians. The language the Beja people speak is the closest language to that of classical Egypt. The history of the Israelite nation began in Egypt, the land of Ham. They entered Egypt, 70 in number, including Joseph, his wife, and two sons who were already in Egypt. They left Egypt numbering over 2 million people. Ancient Israel spent 430 years in Egypt. Throughout the Bible, Israel is described as physically looking like the sons of Ham, in appearance. At this point, we must all agree that Egypt is located in Africa, and that it was full of black people before being conquered by the other nations. Throughout the Bible, the Hebrews were oftentimes confused with the Egyptians. Remember that the ancient Egyptians depicted themselves black on the walls of Egypt. The Bible also says that the Israelites looked like the Ethiopians. Genesis chapter 42, verse 3, and 5 to 6, and verse 8. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt and the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brethren came, and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. Joseph was betrayed by his ten brothers and sold down into Egypt as a slave. After serving for many years, Joseph was appointed to the position of a governor by Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In the process of time, there came a famine in the land of Egypt and many surrounding nations. Joseph's ten brothers came into Egypt to buy corn because of a famine in the land. Everyone who came into Egypt, bought corn from Joseph, but when Joseph's ten brothers came to Africa, they did not recognize their young brother. They did not recognize him because Joseph had grown up and the Egyptians were a black people like the sons of Jacob. Jacob's ten sons considered Joseph to be another black Egyptian. Genesis chapter 50, verse 7 to 8, and 10 to 11. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph, and his brethren, and his father's house, only their little ones, and their flocks, and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And they came to the threshing floor of Adad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Adad, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians, wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. When Jacob died, the children of Israel went back to the land of Canaan to bury their father. When the Canaanites saw the burial procession of Jacob they mistook the Israelites for black Egyptians. Exodus chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, and 18 to 19. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them, and watered their flock. And when they came to Ruel their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, 
an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. The daughters of Ruel, the priest of Midian, mistook Moses for an Egyptian. We know that the ancient Egyptians were black. So, Ruel's daughters did not confuse Moses with an Egyptian because of his clothing but rather because of his black skin. If an African were to put on European clothing, nobody would mistake him for a European. The opposite is also true for a European man who puts on African clothing. Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses was born and raised in Egypt. He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and given an Egyptian name. Moses knew how to speak both Egyptian and Hebrew, and possibly other languages as well. He had African wisdom and knowledge. This is important because the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy known as the Torah, were written by a man of color, raised by people of color, in Africa. Moses looked like an Egyptian, not just because of his clothing but also because of his dark skin resembling that of the ancient Egyptians. Acts chapter 21, verse 37 to 39. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days madest an uproar, and ledest out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. The Apostle Paul was also mistaken for an Egyptian by the chief captain of the Roman guard. Unlike Moses, Paul was a Pharisee and there was no way he would have been dressed like an Egyptian for him to be confused with ancient Egyptians. This means that the Israelites and the Egyptians had black skin as the main thing in common between them. The Israelites looked not only like the black Egyptians but they also had the appearance of the Ethiopians. Today, it is a well-known fact that Ethiopia is in Africa and that the Ethiopians are black. They come from Cush who was the firstborn son of Ham, the youngest son of Noah. Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? saith the Lord. Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? And the Philistines from Kaphtar, and the Syrians from Kair? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob compared his people, the children of Israel to the Ethiopians. Notice also that strong emphasis is given on Israel's exodus from the land of the black, Africa. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may yet also do good, that are accustomed to do evil. In biblical times, the Ethiopians were known for their skin being very black. We know that God likened the children of Israel to the Ethiopians. This would mean that the Israelites bore strong resemblance to the Ethiopians. Cornelius Tacitus, a senator and historian of the Roman Empire who lived about CE 90, is quoted as saying, Many assert that the Hebrews are a race of Ethiopian origins. Tacitus also said that the Hebrews were Egyptians, who left Egypt during a disease outbreak. Historian and scholar, Joel Augustus Rogers commented, For the Romans to have considered the Hebrews Ethiopians is a clear indication of their color, because the Ethiopians are a known black people. Case number 6. One of the apostles in the New Testament was called a nigger, while some of them were born and raised in Africa, or at least found refuge and hid among black Africans. In the book of Matthew, the angel of God told Joseph to arise and take the young child Jesus, and flee into Egypt. He was told to stay there until he received further instructions, because Herod would seek the young child to destroy him. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Joseph was told to take his wife Mary and child Jesus, and flee into Egypt, not for military protection, because at that time, 
Egypt was a Roman province under Roman control. The only reason they fled into Egypt was because Egypt was still a black country, populated by a majority of black-skinned Egyptians. Joseph, Miriam, and Jesus would have been just another black-skinned family among many. Remember, they fled into Egypt to hide from Herod who was seeking to kill baby Jesus. If Jesus and the rest of the Hebrews looked the way Christians and Hollywood portrays them, it would have been somewhat impossible for them to hide in Egypt, among the black Egyptians, and not be noticed. A biblical scholar by the name of Dr. Mark Goodacker, on a BBC program called The Complete Jesus produced in 2001, stated that, Now it's very unlikely that Jesus would have been able to be hidden in Egypt, if he had a very different color of skin from the people in Egypt. Dr. Mark Goodacker also made mention of how the Israelites of the 1st to 3rd centuries wore their hair in afros, and wore short crop black beards. During that time, Egypt was under Roman dominion and Herod was put on the throne of Israel by the Romans. All Herod had to do was check with the Roman officials in Egypt to find out if there were any Hebrews with baby boys around. But, since the Hebrews and the Egyptians had the same physical appearance, it would have been hard to single out a Hebrew family among the black ancient Egyptians. For further proof of the color of the ancient Israelites, let's look at Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon that was called Nigger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Simeon was one of the prophets and teachers at an Israelite congregation in Antioch. He was called a nigger by people in that area. According to Strong's exhaustive concordance, the word nigger is a Latin word that means black. Simon was not called nigger because he was the only black-skinned person there. On the contrary, it was because his hue was darker than the rest of the prophets and teachers. Much like in most Bantu communities, when one of the brothers or sisters have a skin tone that is darker than the rest, they sometimes give that person a nickname, like nigger, or blackie, to describe his skin color. This is why Simeon was called nigger or black. Lucius is another prophet and teacher mentioned along with Simeon, and according to Acts chapter 13 verse 1, he was from Cyrene. Cyrene is a city in Libya, which is located in North Africa. Historians and scholars both agree that the city of Cyrene was a black area, meaning it was heavily populated with black-skinned people in biblical times. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. Cyrene is also the place where Simon, the man who helped Jesus carry the stake was from. Many acknowledge that Simon, the stake bearer, was a black man. It has been confirmed in the book of Acts that there were black-skinned men who were prophets and teachers at the assembly in Antioch. But, it must be understood that the Hebrews were not dealing with any other people or racial group at this time, other than scattered Israel. This is written in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. All these apostles were Hebrews, just like Paul who was also there with them in the assembly in Antioch. Remember Paul was mistaken for a black Egyptian. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. And they compel one Simon a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Salute Rufus chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Simeon, who was called Nigger, and Lucius were prophets and teachers, and as scripture shows us, all the prophets and teachers were Hebrews. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 36. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is a desert. And he arose and went, and, behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning, and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. 
Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth, in his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speak the prophet this? Of himself, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Let's analyze these verses in context. The Ethiopian eunuch was coming to Jerusalem to worship. In those days only the Hebrews went to Jerusalem for worship, because this is where the temple of God stood, making Jerusalem the spiritual home of all Israelites, as it is written in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 verse 6, and chapter 7 verse 6. The children of Israel continued to come to Jerusalem to worship, up until the time of the Roman destruction in AD 70. In fact, many Israelites were worshipping at the temple while the Romans were breaking down the walls of Jerusalem as they were about to lay siege to it. Essentially, this Ethiopian had Hebrew scriptures in his possession. In those days the scriptures were still considered sacred, and remained in the possession of the Israelites, not everyone had access to scripture, as we do today. The children of Israel, whether abroad or in the land, were the primary owners of scripture in those days. The eunuch was baptized by Philip at last. All these verses prove that this Ethiopian eunuch was an Israelite, according to what Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation. If the children of Israel thought it was unlawful to keep company with people of another nation, why would Philip go and keep company with this Ethiopian, if he was not an Israelite? Philip didn't even try to argue with the Spirit, when he was told to go and teach him. The truth is that the Ethiopian was an Israelite who lived in Ethiopia making him one of what we call Ethiopian Jews today. This Israelite eunuch was not called Ethiopian just because he lived in Ethiopia, but because he also looked like a black-skinned native Ethiopian. To this very day, there are many black Israelites who live or have lived in Ethiopia in the past. Many of them are known as the Falasha or Beta Yisrael. Falasha means immigrant, in the language of the native Agao people of Ethiopia. It also means stranger in Amharic. They call themselves Beta Yisrael which means House of Israel, and until recently they lived as a community in Ethiopia. In fact they lived there for the past 3,000 years. This is probably where that Ethiopian Jew who Philip taught came from. The Falasha Jews also say that they are from the tribe of Dan. Acts chapter 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Apollos was an African-born Jew. Alexandria was in Egypt, Africa. Remember that when the Hebrews were in trouble or running from their enemies, they almost always fled to Africa in order to blend in among the black Egyptians, Ethiopians, and Libyans. This is because the Israelites were oftentimes mistaken for these Hamitic races. Clearly, Apollos, Rufus, Simon, and the Ethiopian eunuch were scattered black Israelites living among the dark races of Africa. They and many other black Israelites living in Africa had the scriptures in their possession. This was long before the transatlantic slave trade. Contrary to popular belief, Africa and Arabia received the scriptures first, before Europe and Asia. The people that first brought the Bible to Africa were black. The Bible is definitely not a white man's book because it is very Afrocentric. Some people will try to argue that, if the original Hebrews were black, they didn't remain that way, 
because the Hebrews mixed with many different people. It is true that the Hebrews did some mixing with people of other nations, mainly due to the many captivities they suffered. But one thing to be noted is that, Israel had intermarriages with native Africans more than any other people, hence its racial makeup did not change. Many of the Hebrew patriarchs married or had children with women from the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Canaanites, and Libyans. Abraham had children with Hagar and Keturah, both from Hamitic tribes. Jacob had children with two handmaidens from Africa, and these children became the patriarchs of two tribes of Israel. Judah had sons with the Canaanite woman Shuah. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, with an Egyptian woman named Asenath. Moses married Zipporah, who was Ethiopian. The Hebrews very rarely interacted with Europeans other than through war. Black people have genes that carry dominant traits. Black hair, dark eyes, dark skin are dominant traits. Whereas light hair, light eyes, light skin are recessive traits. The recessive can come from the dominant, but the dominant traits cannot come from the recessive ones, or the lighter one can come from the darker one, but the darker cannot come from the lighter. This is a scientific fact, so if the Hebrews mixed with other people of lighter hues, the offspring would have come out looking like Hebrews with a bit lighter hue, than the Hebrew parent. If they mixed with others of the same or darker hue, the offspring would have continued to look like the Hebrew Israelites. This is why the Egyptians ordered the Hebrew males to be killed and not the females. Because, the Egyptian males could impregnate the Hebrew females, and produce offspring which were still black, and still possessing the physical characteristics of the Egyptians. The descendants of Bantu slaves have mixed seed with the various racial groups of the Americas for over 400 years. But they are still known as a black people. They have mixed with various European, Indian, and Hispanic racial groups and yet, their racial makeup has remained unchanged. One of the reasons for this is that Negro genes carry the dominant traits. Consider, for a moment the children of mixed parents, one black parent and one white. The child will have more traits of the black parent than of the white one. The hair texture of the offspring, skin color, and facial features, will be closer to that of the black parent. Sometimes it's impossible to even tell that the offspring is of mixed parentage, because the child looks like he slash she was conceived by two black parents.